Hello, and welcome to another worry session of civil engineering with Jay Laird. I am the aforementioned Sunny Jay Laird. In this lecture, we'll be continuing our look at one-way slab design. In particular, we'll be looking at uh, continuous rather than uh, simply supported uh, stands, or continuous rather than simply supported uh, slabs. And we'll be working through this example here. So the difference between a simply supported and a continuous slab is, as we've discussed before a bit, the, a continuous slab is one that, can, that is, well, continuous. If you look at the slab here, the uh, slab is actually integrally connected with the beams uh, supporting it. And in turn, this, there is a continuous element of slab all the way across the beams and uh, connecting multiple chains together. So, in, so it is gonna be, this is gonna be very similar to the design of uh, to the, what we previously looked at for simply supported slab. The key difference is that the maximum moment and maximum shear will be very different because this is a, uh, simply supported, uh, so because this is a continuous rather than a simply supported slab. Okay, so uh, now the tricky thing is we need to find out an ultimate shear and ultimate moment to design this slab for. That's going to be our first step. And we have a couple ways to do this. Um, but first of all, I want to get my, uh, let's get our factored load. That will be our first step, and I am going to just copy and paste some things from the previous example. So please, for this video is designed as a follow-up to the previous one. Uh, I suggest watching that one first before you watch this one. So the dead load and live load are going to be the same. There will be no change there. So I can just copy and paste that in. Our ultimate load will still be the 720 pound per foot. Now, we have a couple ways of determining the moments within a slab. We could use an indeterm some indeterminate analysis techniques, like uh, for an element analysis, we could use uh, moment co we could use uh, moment distribution, we could use uh, the force method, we could use a lot of different things, or we might be able to take an easy way out and use the ACI moment coefficients. So what these are, let's go ahead and go to, um, actually let me copy a heading here from our one-way simply supported slab. And let's go to section, this is going to be section of uh, table 6.5.2. Uh, design moment will be based on 6.5.2. Now, I do want to go there and take a look at a few things because we can't just apply these directly. We need to first determine a few things. Okay, now we are going to need not just the beam length, but the beam clear span. And again, the beam here being our one foot wide uh, unit width of beam, or unit width of slab that we treat as a beam. And so we have we have an LM here, and it's not just here. So we have so this 15 feet. This 15 feet is from the center of one support, what one supporting element, to the center of the other supporting element. However, the, the supporting elements themselves are 14 inches long. L sub n is from here to here, rather than from here to here. So we need to subtract out that uh, width of that support. So we have L minus 14 inches, which will come to 13.83 uh, feet. Okay, I want to next go to uh, section 6.5.2, table 6.5.2. So there are a couple. So we need to be very careful when we uh, use these. So we do need to. We can use these simplified moment coefficients. However, we do need to be careful with them. Namely, you can only apply these moment coefficients in certain cases. Uh, members are prismatic. Loads are uniformly distributed. The live load is less than three times the dead load. Uh, there are at least two spans, and the, long, the longer of two adjacent spans is likely to be shorter by more than twenty percent. And we seem to, I think we'll, uh, we'll clearly meet all of those. Our service level dead load is 
200 pounds per foot, and our live load is 200 pounds per foot, so indeed, our live load is not, is not more than two times the bed load. It's 1.5 times the bed load. Okay. So, um, we need to consider this for a moment. Now, the tricky thing about this is that we need to have, uh, we'll have both positive and negative moments. So if I were to look at the uh, actual moment diagram for this, so let's think about what the actual moment diagram for this would look like. Well, the moment diagram is going to look something like this. We will have a combination of negative moments and positive moments. So we'll have, uh, we would have in the middle of spans, we will have a, a positive moment, but then in the at the supports we will have a negative moment, and also negative moments most likely here. So you would end up with a moment diagram that looks something, oh, kind of like this. You will likely end up with a moment diagram that looks something like this. We'll have negative regions and oh, for that. We'll have negative regions and positive regions. And negative and another spline track. And then something like this. So you're going to end up with both negative and positive of your moment diagram. Now, the tricky thing about this is that uh, you, if you're going to design a slab this way, you would need different, uh, you would need different uh, moment capacities depending on how you're designing this. So, uh, depending whether you're in a positive or negative moment region. Now, in real design, how this typically works is that you'll have different steel layouts uh, depending on where you are in the beam. So, in the positive moment region, you'll you might just have a steel like here. Positioned at the bottom of the slab, uh, or you know, again, we're treating a slab as a beam. Uh, so you'd have steel at the near the bottom of the slab to carry the tension for the uh, pods moment regions, and then you'll have steel near the top of the slab in the uh, negative moment regions to carry the tension produced by negative moments. So this is one way to do it, and uh, that is probably that is definitely the most efficient way to handle things. However, uh, for the sake of simplicity, what I think I'm going to do is, um, so again, we can have positive and negative moment in the same slab if the slab is continuous. However, uh, instead of having uh, different sections of tension and compression steel, uh, but the tension and, and compression steel profile varying across the length of the slab, another thing we could do is simply put steel in the middle of the slab. And this is especially useful for thinner slabs and definitely much more useful for slabs than with beams. But what we can do is we can just put our steel in the middle of the slab and just make sure that we, are, we have adequate moment capacity for both positive and negative moment. Because if we put all of our steel in the middle of the slab, then we'll have identical positive and negative moment capacities. Now, truth be told, this is kind of inefficient. Gen in almost all cases, you're, unless you have a cantilever slab, in almost all cases, you're positive moment is going to be greater than a negative moment. So putting all of your steel in the middle of the slab is uh, rather inefficient, but for the sake of this example problem, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so we need to look at this table. Now, in this diagram here, it looks like we have uh, two end spans. It, now, in, in reality, you rarely have just two spans in a building. Usually you have multiple spans. So uh, what, when it's referring to end spans versus interior spans, it's not referring to like the end location on the span. What it is referring to is something like this. If you have multiple spans, say, imagine you have uh, three spans. And you can read the rest of the diagram here. Throwing this together. So imagine you have uh, three spans. This would be an exterior, and that a lot bigger. This would be an exterior span. 
this would be an interior span, and this would be an exterior span. Exterior spans are one that are exterior. They are um, exterior to, they're right at the edge of the building, uh, and that is what the difference between interior and exterior spans is. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, discontinuous ends, integral supports, uh, discontinuous ends, unrestrained, and then interior spans all. Uh, okay, discontinuous ends, integral to support, and discontinuous ends, unrestrained. A discontinuous end unrestrained would be something like uh, this. What they're referring to there is where the rotation of the slab at the edge is unrestrained. So, for example, if your exterior span actually was a cantilever, something like that, this would be an example of an unrestrained exterior slab. Or you could also have a, a unrestrained exterior slab if you had a moment or not a moment, a simply supported span at the edge. So imagine you had uh, two, uh, something, imagine you had something like this, where you still have multiple spans and that are uh, connected together uh, rigidly or continuously. This would be an example of a three span or a two span beam or a two span slab, I should say. So let's say it was rigidly connected at the interior, at this interior beam, but not restrained on the edge, on the edge beam. So here it would be, so what I have here in this diagram, oh, yeah, the wrong thing stuck there. So I want that, something more like here. So imagine I have a, I have a beam, a beam, and a beam. But the interior beam is set up as a rigidly connected T-beam to the slab. But for some reason, the exterior beams are set up as uh, just pin support. They resist X, they resist translation, but not rotation. And maybe to make clear they're not cantilevers, maybe there's something, maybe I can draw them uh, more like this here. So this beam here would be restrained. And this beam, uh, this beam here and here would be unrestrained. This would be again. These would these would both be exterior spans in this example, because we simply don't have an interior span in these two. And however, this would be restrained on this end, or sorry, unrestrained. Move that up there. This would be unrestrained and unrestrained. Unrestrained in this context again refers to a restraint of rotation. A rigid support will not allow the uh, element to rotate at that connection, while a pin support or a roller support will. Okay. So let's see what applies here. Uh, we don't need to worry about interior spans because uh, we have just two spans and they're both uh, end spans. And uh, discontinuous end integral support. So we need to consider both positive and negative regions because again, here we're gonna have both positive and negative end regions. However, like I said, in this case, I'm gonna try using just a, uh, a single layer of steel and a single layout of steel positioned at the middle of the, span, uh, middle of the slab which is a bit inefficient, but the nice thing is it is very constructible. It's a very simple thing to build and it does illustrate the process relatively quickly. Okay, so uh, let's look here. Let's see in the next, so for a positive moment, let's go ahead and just uh, do this really quickly. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, actually add that. Uh, maybe I'll put a note here. Uh, can use table six point ECI table uh, table six point five point two uh, because we meet all the qualifications in section six point five point one, and that's what we looked at previously with the uh, 
6.5.1 as a reminder. Thank you, Kira. All members are prismatic, both being able to first uh, uniformly distributed, etc. Okay, so our n spans. Let's look at our positive moment n span. Uh, we have a discontinuous n. So we have an n two n spans, and they are integral with the support. If you look at our, our drawing here, it seems clear that we are integral with our supports. All right, looking at this. Uh, we're going to have discontinuous and integral support. What that, what the discontinuous end means, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily referring to the cantilever end. Rather, what it's saying is this. If you look at this portion of the slab, this span, the right edge of this is continuous, as in it, it continues through the beam. This end here is discontinuous because it ends. However, it is still integrally, integrally connected with the beam on the left. So our positive moment demand. So this discontinue we have a discontinuous and integral support. Our positive moment demand is going to be WU, our ultimate uh, distributed load, times ln squared over 14. So uh, design positive moment. So this is w, uh, WU times ln squared. Divided by 18, and we don't want this in joules, we want this in six feet, and not so many decimal places. So 7.65 six feet, and we can actually compare that to our previous value, or the value we used in our simply supported phase. And actually, you can see right here, uh, our design moment in the simply supported phase is actually going to be much higher than that in the continuous phase. Now, next I want to look at the negative moment. We need to make sure we can cover both of them. So negative uh, moment, negative moment region, interior face of exterior support. Well, we have member built integers uh, with a supporting spandrel beam. Well, actually we need to know whether these are beams or columns, but as they're drawn, they are beams. So I'm going to assume that this one applies here, WLN squared over 24. So that means our design negative moment Actually, let's go back to this and talk about this a bit. Exterior face of interior. Well, actually, we need to be careful about this. We can't jump directly to that this, this value here. And the reason for that is that we have to consider the uh, exterior and interior faces. So, interior face of exterior support. Uh, in the negative moment region, the exterior face of interior support. So what that means is the ex so for this exterior face of this interior support, what that is referring to is this face right here, where this uh, this is an uh, this is this beam here, or actually this I should uh, show this on the actual system we're dealing with here, right here. Uh, this face here, this intersection, this is the exterior face of the first interior support. This is a interior support. It's not an interior span, but it is an interior support. So that means this, at this location in the in this continuous slab here, we would need to be able to resist uh, W L N squared over nine. So uh, for the uh, let's see. Now we can't use slab spans. Now this is something uh, you can sometimes use. This is a special case you can sometimes use. Slabs that span not exceeding ten feet. We have a span exceeding ten feet, so we can't use this. Um, exterior face of first interior support. Interior face of first exterior support. So this is basically saying when we combine all this together, the exterior face of the uh, the interior face of the first exterior support. This one here. This face here would have, because they're integrally cast, would have W L N squared over 24. W L N squared over 24. But the, the first, the exterior face of the first interior support 
is a W L N squared, and we have just two spans, so that would be W Q L N squared over nine, or just W L N squared over nine. I know this can be very confusing. You have to be very careful with what you're reading. There's a different. We have both exterior supports and exterior faces and exterior spans. I know this can be confusing, but hopefully that uh, laid out. Hopefully that uh, our explanation uh, laid all this out. And then for any other supports, rather than the first interior support or first exterior support, you can use a uh, WLN squared over 11. So our critical mo uh, negative moments, our design negative moments, will be WU times LN squared over 9. And that will equal this thing is called feet. Still, so substantially larger actually than our positive moment region, but much less than our negative moment region. Here. Now, uh, again, we could design this with both positive and negative regions. Uh, steel region, so we would have one steel profile, one rebar profile for the negative moment region, and one for the positive moment region. But uh, for simplicity's sake, I think we'll just go ahead and use a single moment, or have a single moment design, and just use a single layer of steel positioned at the center of the slab. That way, our moment capacity in both positive and negative moment directions will be exactly the same. Okay, so we also, I'm going to go ahead and call this our design up moment. This is going to be our critical value. So that's going to be this over 9 or uh, WLN squared, not LN, not just L, but LN squared. So 15.36. And we don't want to, we also need to get the design shear. And for this, we can look at. Uh, let's see, right here. Approximate shears for non free stress continuous beams and one way slabs. So, exterior face of first interior support and face of all other supports. Now, we could, again, just like with, uh, just like with moment, we could vary this, uh, vary our slab thickness depending on where we are. But I think for simplicity, I'm just going to use a single shear design, which will mean I'll just use the most uh, critical value, this 1.15. W L N over Q. So uh, that so our critical shear, our design shear, or our uh, shear demand will be 1.15 W L N over Q. 1.15 L N over Q, or 5.7276. Now much of this is going to be very similar to what we did. Now that we have our design shear moment. Our process is going to be relative, very similar to what we did for our uh, for our uh, assembly supported beam design. Now, the first thing we need to do is get our uh, is to get our uh, minimum slab thickness and our uh, cover requirements. We'll first look at minimum slab thickness. That. Now let's go to let's go back to the ACI table 7.3.1.1, where minimum slab thicknesses are reached. Now uh, you had to use the minimum thickness was L over 20 with the uh, assembly supported slab, and again that's kind of the most critical case, except that's the worst case scenario, with the exception of the cantilever slabs. And because we actually have both ends continuous for our slab here, uh, we can actually use L over 28 for the minimum thickness, which would be a smaller value. So our minimum thickness is actually going to be L over 28, which uh, if we get rid of the original decimal places will be 6.43 inches. Okay. So uh, let's try. Uh, now we don't want to specify. We don't want to specify a slab thickness of 6.43 inches. That is way too specific. We want something that's a reasonable value. So uh, let's try. We could try different things, but uh, for simplicity, let's try an, a. Especially because I want to have enough moment arms for both positive and negative moment capacity. Let's try maybe a slab thickness of, say, 8 inches. 
uh, to ensure uh, capacity in both negative mode and positive mode directions. While positioning steel at the center, uh, flexural steel at the center of the slab to produce uh, identical uh, positive and negative moment capacity. Uh, uh, try a slab thickness of 8 inches. My instincts say that 6.43 inches just won't be quite enough. I'd rather go a little bit thicker and we can just, uh, if we end up with, if that ends up being too much, we can just use a uh, less steel or a wider steel facing. Okay. So let's try a slab thickness of 8 inches. Then we can always make it thicker if we need to. But I don't think we will need to. We can always make it thinner as well. Uh, H equals 8 inches. Okay. Next, let's go and look at cover requirements. Now, uh, because we're putting our steel at the middle, if we think about this, if we have a slab and we put our steel right at the center, the depth is not going to be the uh, normally the depth of a uh, of our reinforcing steel is the uh, height of the beam minus the cover depth minus half their bar diameter. Uh, if you think about it from a beam perspective, of course this is a, I'm sorry, this is a beam, not a slab. But if you have a, a, a bar here. D again is the distance from our compression face, the centroid of our reinforcing steel. This is D. Now normally, and again this is R, from the edge of the steel to the edge of the beam, the outer surface of the beam, is our cover depth. We use uh, more than was required last time. And we'll definitely have more than required if we're putting our steel right in the middle of this four inch thick slab. This being, again, from the edge of the concrete to the edge of the bar is our cover. And normally, uh, we can treat the, uh, normally the depth D will equal our uh, beam height H. Actually, I'm going to write it in uh, for just reason's sake. Let me illustrate what H is again. H is the entire thickness of our uh, beam or slab. Normally, our depth is just D, uh, it's just H minus uh, the diameter of the bar over 2, half the bar diameter, uh, minus the cover depth. And we had, and when we calculated that previously, we went and actually assumed a, conserv a very conservative value. Uh, just for our bar diameter, we assumed the largest bar size uh, you can, other than using the very large uh, number 18 bar, I believe. Um, but here, if we position our steel right at the center, uh, that means that that actually means the uh, depth D is going to be very easy to figure out. It's simply going to be half of the slab thickness. It's not going to be H minus the cover depth minus half the bar diameter. Rather, it's just going to be half of the slab thickness or four inches. Continuing on, go back and work, continue going through this. Save. Now, next thing I want to do is check shear. Just to make sure my, my thickness is sufficient, or our thickness is sufficient to produce shear. Okay. So our beam width is one foot, a uh, phi for shear is 0.75. Now, here, uh, we need to make sure our uh, prime C is that same 40 to 100 PSI we assumed, and FY is still uh, 60 PSI. 
Now, uh, just pre as previously, uh, again, we, you can refer to the discussion in the previous video for this in depth. This is referring to ACI 9, table 9.6, or section of table 9.6.3.1. Go ahead and go there really quickly. 9.6.3.1, minimum thickness here. Let's see. Uh, 9.6.3.1. Now, she uh, minimum shear reinforcement AVMIN is required if BU uh, is greater than um, uh, the T lambda root X times T BWD. And uh, let's see. And uh, according to this equation, this BU is greater than uh, T lambda root X times T BWD. According to that, it is actually required. However, one of the exceptions to that is if you have a shallow depth uh, uh, slab or shallow depth beam. Uh, but this is actually a uh, this is actually a uh, when you, this is a slab that is uh, very uh, very shallow. Only eight inches thick, so we actually do meet this uh, less than ten inch requirement. So the AV min doesn't uh, requirement doesn't apply. We don't need shear reinforcement, which is good because it will be very difficult to stitch uh, shear strips within a uh, regular uh, reinforced concrete slab. Okay, so we can go ahead and get VC, which is our uh, which is our uh, our VC here. Uh, let's see. So we have two times lambda times f times b over oh, times bw times c, which is six point four k. Then we have we can calculate vc and our uh, which will be equal to our v shear capacity, and this will then be equal to uh, uh, bv times v, which is uh, our so our nominal shear capacity is six point four four k. And multiplying by our resistance factor, we get a, a shear capacity of four point a design shear capacity of four point three k. Unfortunately, this is actually going to be uh, less than our demand shear that we previously determined. So, if we're going to do this, we need to go and uh, in, find a way to increase our shear capacity of our concrete. If you were designing, a, if we were designing a regular beam, we could just add shear reinforcement. But unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that simply because we don't have this is a slab and we cannot add a shear strip to it. So um, we have a couple of ways we could address this. Notice the shear capacity is based on the, the depth of the slab, the depth B, rather than the overall height of the, or thickness of the slab. So uh, and because our uh, we positioned our steel right at the middle of the slab, this does mean that we basically have the smallest D possible. So uh, we have a couple ways of doing this. We could use, we could have different layouts of uh, reinforcing steel, depending if we're in our positive or N negative moment regions, or we could just make our slab thicker. So I would like to keep just one uh, shear or just one uh, steel profile if I can, and uh, just position that the middle all the way through the slab, this example. And uh, if we're going to do that, the only way we can increase our shear capacity will be to use a thicker slab. And so, what if I, I'm wondering, what if we take it up to the limit where we don't have to worry about AV min? What if we take it right up to 10 inches? Let's see if that will do it. And that makes B equal to 5 inches. And if we do that, our shear capacity will be sufficient. Uh, our demand shear will still be 5.7 kips, and our design shear capacity will be 6.04 kips. So, based on the shear capacity as the shear demand alone, we're going to need to increase our uh, our uh, slab thickness as long as we're keeping all of our steel right at the center of our slab. Okay, moving along. Here, uh, we're adequate for that. So let's get our uh, Shear capacity. Or sorry, let's look at start looking at moment capacity. So our area of steel. Now we need to guess a certain area of steel. Last time we had an area of steel equal to 0.75 inches, uh, square inches per uh, square foot of beam, or per foot of beam, uh, 
first foot of the slab for our primary flexural heel. And uh, so I think here we can probably get away with less because a continuous slab is typically going to be less critical than a, a simply supported slab. However, we do have a smaller moment on it. So let's just start with a simple round number of one inch squared. And if that's the case, our extension force, if we're seeing this deal as heels, is going to be six feet hip. And theta one uh, is not going to change. We have, we're between 4,000 and 8,000 psi. We have the same theta value. Then the area of the stress block required to balance the zero yield force is going to be 16.68 or 69 inches squared. So we can get rid of these ridiculous decimal places. But not too important as long as we're not specifying something like that. And the corresponding depth of the Whitney stress block is going to be 1.31 inches. And this is just, again, ba very basic elementary uh, beam design. So considering that, our, the depth for our uh, neutral axis will be 1.58 inches, dividing a, dividing a by beta. And we need to determine if the steel has yielded. Uh, using this strain, uh, using this value of the neutral axis, we can determine that the strain in the steel is going to be 0 0.0064, which indeed is greater than our yield stress, or sorry, not yield stress, yield strain in our steel. So indeed, our steel will have yielded. So our assumption that the steel yield as yielded will be correct. Uh, let's keep moving along. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, determine our C and our moment capacity. Now we have this second design moment capacity here because in that previous case we iterated a couple times. We didn't even see that here, but let's find out. Okay. So uh, our moment arm length is D minus A over 2, uh, which will come to 4.35 inches in, in this case. And that produces a, a, a nominal moment capacity of 21.73 kg. Then, uh, let's see here. So this statement isn't true. In fact, our uh, strain in our steel is, in this case, for the 1 square inch of steel, Per uh, one square inch of steel per unit uh, width of beam or unit width of slab is in fact greater than our yield strain. So uh, that means our uh, C factor, uh, and again, if you can find this in ACI table 21.2.2, let's just go back to that one more time just to illustrate where this is coming from. This is a few factors, that is, these are resistance factors, so this is pretty important. 21.2.2, something we've seen before, but it always gives you a view. So, because the strain in our extension steel is greater than uh, 0.03 plus the yield strain in our steel, uh, and that means we have a C factor equal to 0 0.9. So, our C for, and which I, dub, which I dubbed CM, because we get that for a moment, uh, just to separate out the moment and the shear fee factors, will just be equal to 0 0.9. And thus, we have a uh, C, and then when we multiply the nominal moment capacity times C, we get 19.56 uh, kg. And then finally, we can look at the moment capacity. 15.5, uh, 15.3 uh, is less than 19.56, so that moment capacity is adequate. So our demand is less than our uh, available supply. So yes, this moment capacity is adequate. And uh, now I wonder if we can get away. We do have a pre we do have extra capacity here. So I'm wondering if we could get away with using a 0.75. Could we knock that area of steel uh, per foot of uh, slab? down from 1 inch squared to 0.75. Let's go ahead and give that a try. That lowers our tension force down to 45. Uh, air Whitney stress block will thus decrease. And let's see, so our steel is still yielded. That's not, that's not unexpected. We should have a larger strain. And in this case, oh, that's actually not going to work. At 0.75 inches squared, uh, that is actually not going to be sufficient. So maybe we could, let's see if we put that up a little bit. 
uh, increase that back up a little bit, let's try an area of steel of 0 0.8 inches squared. And if we do that, that will have a, a, a dynamo capacity uh, nicely matched to our uh, demand, our ultimate moment capacity. Uh, so that will be a, our, our required ultimate moment capacity. So I'm going to say that, yes, let's go ahead and say that the area of steel required will be, again, per foot of, being, of a tab is 0 0.8 inches squared. Now, uh, with that in mind, with that determined, we need to actually iterate, not iterate, or at least uh, experiment until we get a uh, some actual spacing. For our flexible steel. And again, keep in mind the difference between flexural steel and temperature and shrinkage steel. Uh, flexural steel is the steel that you're using to actually carry moment. That is it. Now, if you have a if you have a two-way slab, flexural steel will be running in both directions. But if you have a, a one-way slab, flexural steel will only run in the primary direction, while shrinkage and temperature steel will be the minor steel running perpendicular to the flexural steel. Now, the clear cover, uh, we have a different ways of figuring this out, uh, but the minimum clear cover is going to be 1.5 inches right here. So we can use that value. It, it, this is based on, if we look at here, if we look at uh, C sub C, we're going to go to the section in the code here where they define, where all the variables are defined. And this is clear cover of reinforcement in inches. Now, we have a couple ways of doing this. All right, so let's get to 24.2.2. Uh, for we have to consider a maximum spacing, and that's the maximum spacing of bonded reinforcement in non C-stress beams and, and one-way slab. Now, um, we need to consider C sub C. And this will be a little bit tricky because we don't know the bar size yet. So uh, let's go ahead and figure that out. Um, and so we have a couple ways of doing this. So, uh, our, we got to think about this carefully. The larger the clear cover, the, the smaller the maximum spacing, which is actually, a, so assuming a larger clear cover distance is conservative. Uh, and a, that clear cover is going to be, uh, is going to be, uh, the clear cover is going to be smaller the larger the bar size. So if you want, uh, if you don't know the exact bar size and you want to be, uh, if you want to be conservative, rather than taking the cover depth as from the beam edge to the edge of the beam, you or from the beam edge to the edge of the seal, you could actually just take the cover depth uh, from the beam edge to the center of the seal, and that would be conservative. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a cover depth of uh, just equal to my beam depth of six inches, or sorry, five inches. Uh, so that will be that, and thus our uh, we'll have our minimum spacing requirements. Now our tension working stress here. Uh, again, we can use uh, two thirds of Fy. Let's go ahead and do that. And our maximum spacing, if we do this here, will be 50 times 40,000 over FS, or here, uh, 12 times 40,000 over FS. The lesser of, uh, OK, so actually, this is not going to work. This is not going to be very efficient. This is telling us that our max, if we do that, if we assume that full uh, diameter, then we're going to have a, uh, we're going to have a maximum spacing of 2.5 inches, which is going to be a bit ridiculous and very lot. Well, I suppose that wouldn't be too bad depending on how we do this, but um, maybe instead we could assume a bar diameter of an inch, or maybe uh, again the, uh, again the uh, we're going to end up with a large. The problem here is that we're going to end up with a large clear cover. Because we are just using a single uh, layer of steel at the center, or a single layout of steel, with all steel positioned at the right, at right at the center of the uh, slab, but inevitably it's going to end up with a larger 
uh, stair cover distance, which means this the minimum spacing is going to be quite small. So we could decrease this a bit by maybe taking into account the car size. So if we're using, so we could be conservative and only subtract a small amount, maybe use a uh, number four bar. So, but even that wouldn't get us that much. If we do a number four bar, we'd have to subtract that a half bar diameter. So that would be like four eighths uh, of an inch of an inch uh, divided by two. But still, it isn't going to help us that much. Although that would increase the maximum spacing of 3.125 inches, which would allow us to use a spacing of three inches. So I think we should maybe go ahead and do that. And let's try a bar spacing of three inches. So the downside of using a, uh, of using a, uh, putting our scale right at the center is that we have a large cover requirement or a large place cover, which in turn means that this requirement for maximum flexible spacing is going to be very small. This is one of the downsides of doing this. But let's just go ahead and roll with it. I think we'll be fine. So if our spacing, again, the center to center spacing is three inches, that means the actual area of the bar is going to be, uh, the actual required area of the bar is going to just be 0.2 inches, 0.2 square inches, or a bar area, a bar diameter of 0.504 uh, inches. So uh, let's see. Now, I wonder if we use a, uh, if we use a bar diameter of, uh, let's see, let's consider this thing, but a bar diameter of, uh, let's see, of 0.504 inches is required. I'd like to use a bar diameter of five, of 0.5 inches, because that would be a number four bar, but, uh, for a spacing of, actually, spacing of three inches. Here. So if we do this, we'll have to, so we can't actually, that is the minimum bar diameter for a spacing of three inches. So instead, we're going to have to use a slightly larger bar, which will be a bar diameter of, say, a number bar size of maybe uh, five eighths of an inch. So maybe a uh, number five bar. We unfortunately won't be able to use number four bar. That's just not quite going to do it. So let's use maybe number five bars. Uh, spaced at three inches for our primary flexible reinforcement. And again, I know this is rather inefficient to have that this large bar of solutions this close together, but that is the downside of you positioning all the steel right at the center of our paint, of our slab. So, uh, and maybe I could do, maybe I could work through this again, having different steel layouts for the positive and negative moment region. So uh, let's finish this up then by just uh, so again this is kind of re this is rather inefficient that is kind of the, this that is kind of the trade off you make if you just position all of your steel at the center putting all your steel right at the center does allow you to have a single positive and negative moment capacity but the downside is it's not very efficient okay so let's go ahead and design the temperature and uh, uh, temperature and shrinkage steel. And our gross beam area is going to be uh, is going to be this. We have a beam, a gross area of a uh, gross gross beam uh, width of one inch and a depth of uh, one of uh, a depth of five inches, half the beam height. So here we're going to need a uh, by multiplying 0 0.0018 times our gross area, we get a required shrinkage steel of 0 0.108 inches square inches per uh, unit width of beam. Uh, so the maximum spacing is going to be uh, 5 times h or 8 inches. So uh, let's just go ahead and so let's just go ahead and use maybe the same spacing of 12 inches. And this would result in a beam diam depth uh, or a uh, beam uh, a steel diameter of point minimum steel diameter of 0.37 inches. So let's see what a 3 over 8 would look like. Uh, or maybe a 3 divided by 8 inches and in inches that would be 0.375 so that actually would do this that would actually be sufficient so we could use the number of three bars position 12 inches on center so if we're just we were to draw this out 
so copy this and position this over here. So here the slab thickness would be 10 inches. Our slab thickness would be 10, 10 inches and rather than number four bars in our secondary seal or in our shrinkage and, and treat seal, the shrinkage and temperature seal, we would have number three bars and the spacing, well, we'll have that same 12 inch spacing for this calculation. And the primary seal though, however, will be uh, have a spacing of three inches, so it's very close together, especially for a slab. And will be uh, will be these here, these number five bars. Again, this is a rather inefficient design, but that is the downside of positioning all of your seal right at the center of your slab. Number five bars, typical. Okay. So uh, again, it is more. It would be more efficient to actually position our uh, have separate uh, positive and negative moment uh, regions, separate positive negative moment and positive and negative moment regions, and just have different seal profiles in each. And I think we will cover that in a follow up video. But uh, for now, if you position all of your seal right at the centroid of the, right at the center of your slab, this seal layout should be sufficient with uh, number uh, five bars positioned at three inches on center and number three bars for our, and that's for uh, the number five bars at three inches on center is for our primary flexible seal, while the number three bars positioned at, uh, positioned at 12 inches on center would be our, would be sufficient for our uh, shrinkage and temperature seal. And again, we have this maximum slab, maximum allowable slab thickness of 10 inches for our slab. Okay, I guess I think in a follow-up video I will look at uh, doing this for a uh, for a slab that has different uh, seal layouts for both uh, primary, for both positive and uh, negative moment uh, seal. But for now, I think this will do it. So please let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to leave them in the comments and uh, comments below. Like, comment, subscribe to make the robots happy, and be on the lookout for that next video where we'll look at actually designing continuous one-lay slabs for. Uh, for the case of where we just we don't put the seal right at the center and we have separate positive and negative moment region seal. All right, that'll do it for now. Again, please let me know if you have any questions. Like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. And I hope to see you in the next video where we will look at a separate positive and negative moment region seal. So I hope you found this video informative or perhaps a bit uh, enlightening or at least a bit useful when designing a uh, continuous uh, one-way uh, reinforced concrete slabs. I hope to see you all in the next video and I'll see you in the next lecture. And as always, thank you.